This is FRM Part 2, Book 3, Operational Risk and Resiliency, and the chapter on Risk Capital Attribution and Risk Adjusted Performance Measurement. Notice the first two words in the chapter title, Risk Capital. We're going to add this term to our toolbox that has previously included economic capital and regulatory capital. And we're going to do it in the context of a cushion. And this is what the first paragraph or so in this chapter refers to risk capital as a cushion or kind of a buffer. You know, I think about all the stuff I learned back in uh, the days when I was studying financial planning. And I bet you guys have heard this as well. Financial planners all, always say things like this. Well, you should have an emergency cash available to you in highly liquid assets that would cover you from three to six months in case of an emergency. And I always, I always question when someone says three months, I always want to know why is it not two months or four months. But anyway, it sounds like a pretty good buffer. Uh, but then again, you have to look at what is the potential for financial loss and what constitutes an emergency. I mean, look at your own families, you know. Most of you have husbands or wives and, and probably children and, and homes. And if you think about it, what's the worst thing that could happen? I mean, from a financial perspective, you could lose it all. And three to six months of emergency cash is probably not going to help you out very much. But if you're like I am, you know, you, you have these, you know, kind of discrete events. A couple of years ago, we had lightning strike our garage and uh, it blew out our garage door opener. And so I had to have that repaired. And, uh, you know, that was a kind of a minor expense. Um, so you have to look at this risk capital in terms of its context and its application to things like worst case scenarios. So we'll probably talk a little bit about value at risk and some of the other concepts that we've studied over the last couple of chapters. So if you look at the learning objectives, you'll, you'll see what I mean here. What stands out to me, look at this, oh my gosh, the third one down. We have a compute, and then we have a calculate, and then we have another compute. And those of you who are mathematically oriented will probably breathe a sigh of relief because it's been quite some time since, since we've had to do any math. Let me go ahead and just remind you the difference between the compute and the calculate uh, action words. Remember, calculate is, uh, it kind of has a subtle implication that it's an easier problem. Maybe you could do one plus one, that would be a calculation. But compute means that you, you might need a computer or you might need some uh, extra resources to solve the problem. So even though those two words are generally used interchangeably, calculate is probably just a little bit easier than compute. But if you look at that first uh, learning objective up there, look, risk capital, economic capital, and regulatory capital, we, we've talked about that before, so that's good news. Risk adjusted return on capital. Now, there's a specific definition inside of this chapter, but we've done this from the very first accounting class that we have. It's going to be net income over some investment. You know, that's pretty standard. Uh, look at that next one under the compute and interpret. We're going to explain challenges. Now, this should be familiar because we have faced these challenges in a host of previous chapters. So this is kind of a similar vein um, that these chapters run through. And, and so the challenges are going to be similar to the other challenges that we have talked about. And then we'll end with some best practices, which we have been doing a lot of lately as well. All right, so let's go ahead and, and start with that very first learning objective. What is the purpose of risk capital? Hey, there's that word cushion uh, that we've put in the slide that is used in the first chapter, or I'm sorry, in the first uh, paragraph or so. Cushion against various risks taken on by a business. All right, so two purposes probably be a good idea to memorize these. Retain financial integrity, um, retain the status as a going concern in the event of a near catastrophic event. Remember, going concern means that businesses and financial institutions make decisions on the assumption that they're going to be around a lot longer than I'm going to be around, right? I have a fixed date. Someday I'm going to croak, but financial institutions, at least today, make decisions based on the uh, idea that they'll be around forever. 
And then, of course, the second one is, uh, you know, a relatively recent idea. Uh, when I say recent idea, I mean, you know, 20 or 30 years. What did we learn back in our first finance class? Maximize uh, the value of the firm, maximize shareholder wealth. Well, there's a whole range of research now that focuses not just on shareholders, but all of the stakeholders. And so this, uh, this risk capital is going to probably provide at least a little bit of extra confidence that our stakeholders have and the ability of the institution to remain solvent. I sure hope I don't have to read those two definitions for you down the left-hand column. We've done this before. Economic capital is the institution's own capital estimate. So remember that the, uh, the financial institution and the organization's leaders know way more about the institution than its bondholders or its shareholders or its regulators. And so economic capital is a totally important concept. Okay, remain solvent and maintain its day-to-day -day operations. Regulatory capital, on the other hand, uh, suggests we have these government regulators or some authoritative body out there, these, these individuals who are smart men and women as well, and they come in and they, they look at our financial institution and they say, oh, you're like this one, this one, this one, and this one, and this one, these other financial institutions. Therefore, your regulatory capital looks about like this. And there's an illustration over there. We've seen this one in multiple chapters before, and it's a good picture that uh, illustrates the relationship between the loss frequency going up the vertical axis and then the amount of loss. And so note the amount of loss then, you know, all the way over in that far right tail. And you ought to, uh, you ought to think of that as a worst case loss and you ought to think of this distribution as not being normal. I mean, there we clearly have some skewness in there, but, uh, and we've talked about some compelling reasons of why this distribution is going to be skewed. Uh, it may not be skewed in the exact manner that we've put on this slide, but skewness exists uh, nevertheless. Um, Traditional purpose of this risk capital, this cushion, so look at that up at the top there, an indicator of the amount of capital a firm requires to remain solvent given its portfolio of risky investments. So that's pretty much a standard. We've talked about this for probably years and years, decades and decades, maybe not, maybe not centuries, but surely decades. But there are some emerging uses, and I would know these. All right, so evaluating performance and incentive compensation at, at all different kinds of levels, right? So think about these business units. So we've got these silos here, and then we have our chief risk officer who's in charge of all of this stuff, and then we have other organizational leaders, and then we have the board of directors up here, and that board is you know, making a determination on uh, what those senior executives ought, ought to be compensated. And so risk capital can provide some extra information, some valuable marginal information to be able to not only evaluate, but to provide compensation packages that are consistent with those individuals and groups of individuals who can consistently show a mastery of managing risk capital. Uh, active management of portfolio for entry and exit decisions. What your textbook and chapter talk about here in this paragraph is almost, it almost sounds like a capital budgeting framework. Which businesses to invest in and which ones to exit, which ones to reject. Almost like capital budgeting in terms of a company like uh, Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson introducing a new shampoo. Is that a good idea or not? Well, you can use risk capital to help make that decision because what it does is it provides more information. Now, of course, that can be applied to financial institutions. Let's take a simple financial institution and ask the question, do we want to get involved in trading of derivative securities? So that would be an entry decision. And boy, how much risk capital would we need to go into that new market? And then I always like the, the last circle point there, pricing transactions. I'm a big believer that it's the, mo the most important thing you can do. What have I told you guys? 
identify the risk, and then quantify the risk. And so that's what this third one is here. In order to quantify it, you've got to be able to price all of this variability. All right, let's get to that learning objective that asks us to compute something. All right, so we've got this risk-adjusted return on capital. And so notice what I told you back in that first slide. You know, in the numerator, we have some kind of net income. And then in the denominator, we have some kind of an investment. So we're going to call this after-tax risk-adjusted net income. And we've put an example in another slide uh, or two here. So you'll see exactly how this works. So it's some kind of net income divided by what we're going to refer to as economic um, capital. So here's the good formula that you'll have to memorize. Um, look in the numerator there. This sounds an awful lot like, all right, we're trying to figure out what is the change in cash from a particular investment opportunity. And notice that we put capital budgeting term in the title of this, uh, of this slide. So go back to your memories of computing net present value an internal rate of return, maybe all the way back to your undergraduate days, and that's pretty much what that numerator is. All right, expected revenues minus those expected expenses, let's say, but your text uh, calls them costs, minus expected losses, and then of course the government has to get involved. So we're going to have to uh, we're going to have a tax liability and a tax expense. And then a return on that risk capital, which would be interesting here. And then we'll add or subtract transfers. And then down the left-hand column, I have definitions for all of those uh, terms right there. But I'm guessing you guys, uh, you guys know that. One of the things I wanted to point out, if you skip down to the return on economic capital, that's the return on the risk-free uh, government and bonds, assuming here we're in the United States using our treasury securities, and this is going to be based on the amount of allocated risk capital. Because remember, this is a cushion. It's a buffer. So we're going to take this and we're going to put it over there and we're going to invest it in something pretty safe, like a treasury bond, so that we know if we need it to cover these catastrophic one-time, can I say one-time losses. Uh, and then the transfers, these are up or downstream transactions between business units. And uh, do you remember when we had our conversation on like a, a futures contract? And so suppose we're going to hedge an interest rate risk with a treasury bond futures contract. And so we need we need some kind of a margin. Now, a lot of times you can use treasury securities to um, to post that margin, uh, but when there is daily settlement, you're going to have to put up some cash so that the government bonds, they have to come from someplace, and then the cash has to come from someplace. So that's what that transfer is. Now let's go ahead and define economic capital just a little bit differently than we've done in the past. It's the summation of risk capital and strategic capital. Okay, So strategic capital is the risks and the amount of capital associated with large, potentially highly profitable investments. All right, so what does that sound like? Large, so it's a substantial investment, potentially highly profitable, profitable, which implies that this project probably has a high standard deviation, right? So look at what we've put there in bold. It's shrouded in uncertainty. I'm not sure what that means because right as talented executives, we need to decloud. I'm not sure if that's a word, but I'm guessing you understand what I meant. We need to decloud the shroud of uncertainty, right? That's what we're getting paid to do. And then you can think of strategic risk capital as well in terms of the goodwill that has been built up on the financial statements by the organization, plus some burnt out capital which your textbook defines. Um, and it reminded me mostly of like a sunk cost. Uh, if you remember from your accounting days, what a sunk cost is. So burnt out capital is, you know, investments that have already been made and they may or may not be amortized over the life of the project, but you're probably not going to get that back if you decide at some point to reject this project.
All right, here's an example. So we have a U.S. bank building a portfolio of corporate loans with the following characteristics. All right, so principal amount, $10 billion. Uh, we're demanding a return of 7%. Uh, direct costs are 1% of the principal amount. Uh, funded by 10 billion of retail deposits that attract an interest charge of 4%. All right, so remember what we're doing here as a, as a bank, right? So we have all these deposits over here. Those represent our liabilities. So we're going to take those liabilities and convert them into, well, we could just leave them in cash, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. We could go out and we could buy some land. That probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, probably, maybe sometimes. Or we can invest in some kind of uh, income generating asset. So that's what we're doing here with this corporate loan portfolio. Chief risk officer projects expected loss of 1%, worst case loss of 7%, um, and this is uh, on an annual basis. And so what does that mean? We're making $10 billion in loans and we expect a billion, uh, a billion, we expect 1% of, uh, of that to be an expected loss, right? Risk-free rate, 3%, tax rate, 30%, oh, 30% tax rate, oh. So painful, isn't it? All right, so look at the bot and transfer zero. Compute the risk adjusted return on capital. So here's the mathematics of it. And so uh, we have um, copied the formula in blue up at the top from the previous page. So let's skip down to the bottom and work through the mathematics of this. So our revenues, um, what's our total? We've got 10 billion, right? And we're expecting 7%. So that gives us 700 million in expected revenues and then our operating expenses are going to be the one here, let me go back here real quick they're going to be the direct one percent and the four percent that we have to pay our uh, our depositors right so that's 500 million and so i want you i want you to just think about this look the quality of the asset this is what we learned from medigliani and miller back in 1958 we learned that the quality of an asset depends on the ability of a firm to make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. So that's essentially what that 700 minus the 500 million looks like. And that's got to be the bulk of the evaluation of whether this project is worthwhile. Now, we have some other things that are going on here as well. And so let's go ahead and do those. So expected loss is 100 million. So we're so we're going to take out 100 million from that 200 million, you know, kind of a net margin, let's call it. Uh, but then what are we going to do? Our, um, our return on risk capital. So we're taking that 600 million. Now, where do we get that 600 million? So we have a worst case loss, 7%, and the expected loss of 1%. So if we multiply that by 10 billion, we get our economic capital, and then multiply that by that 3%. What did we say that was back there? Did we say it was a risk-free rate of interest or did we say it was a U.S. government treasury bond yield to maturity? Either way, there's that 3%. So that takes care of everything in the bracket because we had transfers of zero. And then, of course, we have to take out taxes. And so you could, you could do all that stuff and then multiply it by 30% and then take it out. Or you could do it the simple way by multiplying by one minus the tax rate. So there you have it, 13.77% um, as the, where am I here? Oh, I went, uh, I went the wrong way. The risk adjusted return on capital, 13.77%. Um, your chapter then goes on to ask the question, all right, well, what we've just done there is we've, we've computed this one year kind of uh, an interest rate, right? Some kind of a return. But of course, we emphasized, and the chapter does a pretty good job of emphasizing that we're operating as a going concern. So is it possible that we want to do a series of one-year horizons, or do we want to put it into an intertemporal model? And so it's possible to look at a multi-period um, return spanning as many as five years. Now, the problem, of course, is that once we try to predict what happens in year two and year three and four and five, we're going to be less and less accurate as time goes by. 
So remember how we talked about in a previous chapter about decay and trying to f come up with a model that attaches greater importance to the most recent uh, historical data. Well, this is kind of the opposite of that. You know, we, we want to attach greater accuracy in year one forecast versus year five forecast. That's why, let me go ahead and turn myself down. You know, we got this, it's not a normal distribution, but if we had a normal distribution, you know, looking this way, boy, as we move out in time, then we can be less and less certain, which means we're going to be less and less accurate as we um, as we predict these, and let me just go back here, expected revenues and expected costs and expected losses three years and four years and five years down the line. Now, I said to you earlier that we're probably going to talk about value at risk and look at that. Uh, what is that? The third circle point there. Risk capital can also be viewed as the one year value at risk at a confidence level that reflects the firm's target credit risk rating. Boy, that's a mouthful right there. Now, what does that mean? Of course, it has some meaning that that these two these two concepts, uh, value at risk and um, economic capital, and I'm sorry, and risk capital have extremely similar meanings, and this has great implications for credit risk discussions that we've had over the last few chapters, and operational risk that we've also talked about in the last few chapters. Now, how do we deal with market risk? You know, what we're probably likely to do as good financial risk managers is say, all right, what happens tomorrow or what happens by the end of the week or, or maybe as long as two weeks? So notice what we have there, 10 days or one day, because market movements are way more frequent. Here, let me go back here. There, those changes are way more frequent and volatile than expected revenues and costs are over an entire year period, right? So what we're going to have to do then is adjust our one day or three day or seven day or 10 day value at risk into an annual figure. And we're going to do that using the square root of time rule that we have talked about in the past. Remember I said to you in a previous recording that uh, variability moves through time at the square root. All right, so notice that formula there, the one day value at risk. We multiply that by the square root of the number of business days in a year. All right, so I have an example here and we're going to work through that, but let's go ahead and um, talk just briefly about this note of caution. <clears throat> we need to use the square root of time rule and we need to fine tune it because of two big reasons. The primary reason is this uh, idea of overcoming a period of stress that's occasioned by a major loss. Right. So what's going to happen is that if we have this gigantic loss, what we want to do is try to shrink that gigantic loss down to a risk core level. And the square root of time may or may not precisely do that. So look at the second reason there. We need to scale down that current risk level to its core le risk level. And one of the ways to do that is to liquidate some investments. So let's look at an example and you'll see why those one points one and two are important. All right, so our daily value at risk is 100. Our core risk level is just 80. And so we're going to need 10 days to reduce our current risk level to our core risk level. And we're going to reduce value at risk by just uh, two a day. All right, so 252 business days a year which I always find really interesting in, in these chapters. We've always done 252. When I was in graduate school, uh, my professor, we, we always did 250. And of course, there's a difference mathematically between 250 and 252. Uh, and I'm wondering why the difference between the academic world, now, of course, this is 30 years ago, right? Didn't I get my PhD? Almost 30 years ago. And, and today's financial risk management uh, chapter topic. So maybe it's just a difference in time. All right, so let's go ahead and compute this risk capital. So notice we're going to start with 100. So let me go back here, right? Our daily value at risk is 100, and we're going to reduce it by 
by two every day. So we have, we're down to 98, then we're down to 96, right? 94, all the way down to 80. So if you get your fingers out really quickly, you do that one, two, three, four, five, that gets you, that's 10 days, right? So we need to sum all of those for 10 days and then subtract the days needed to reduce the current um, to the core. So if you do that math there quickly, you get uh, 1277. Now let's go ahead and do that other calculation. Let's transform our one day VAR of 100 into um, an annual value at risk so that you get the 1587. So the required risk capital then is going to be the 1277 divided by the 1584. So what does that come out to be about 80 or 81%? Now, back to this old conversation we've had multiple times, and uh, this chapter would be incomplete if it didn't mention this. Of course, the choice of the confidence level has a material impact. You know, do we want to be 75% confidence confident? Do we want to be 95% confident? Do we want to be 100% confident? Well, we do know that you can't be 100% confident in just about anything in life. Uh, if anything, although they do say that death and taxes are the only certainties out there. Of course, the higher the confidence level, the higher will be the amount of risk capital that is necessary. Now, there's a section in this chapter that discusses uh, two kinds of approaches to probability of default. And so you think of these two as asking two very different, but yet similar questions. Um, Let's just suppose I'm, I'm, one of your, I'm one of your borrowers and you're the financial institution. You could, you could ask yourself, or let's suppose it's a five-year loan. You could ask yourself the question, what's the probability that Jim is going to default in three years, uh, two months, and 16 days? That's the point in time probability of default. And so the probability that I'm going to default on that day or maybe in that week, if you want to extend it out a little bit, or that month, or even then the third year of, of that, what did I say, a five-year loan. Now, you probably don't want to do point in time all the way out to a year, but you, you could do that. But you get, you get the sense of this, a point in time probably, probability of default for me defaulting on a specific date is probably going to be pretty low, right? Yeah, let's take a deep breath and say, all right, Jim, are you sure that it's probably pretty low? Because... What could happen over time if I make all my payments? You may, as the financial institution, say, all right, Jim has made all these payments. He's probably not going to default tomorrow or next week or the next day. But you don't know all that stuff today when you, when you lend me that capital. On the other hand, I, I might be an intense gambleholic, and I may be taking all of my income and betting it on the horse races, and you don't know that. And so that would elevate this. Uh, this probability of default. But nevertheless, you process all the information you have. Probably a lot of that has come from what I have given you, relying on maybe my integrity. That's why, boy, don't we talk about asymmetry of information and all different sorts of things when certain people know certain different things uh, about a potential investment. As opposed to a through the cycle probability of default, which would then consider the the exact notion that whatever I know about my finances, you know about my finances. So if I'm working really hard and I make a lot of money, then the probability of default goes down, right? But then if I'm going to the racetrack and betting every day, then probability of default goes up. So those are the two stylized approaches. Now let's get back to the to computation of the risk-adjusted return on capital, and let's, let's invoke our capital budgeting decision rule that we had way back in our undergraduate days as finance and accounting students. What do we know? We know that an organization will invest in any project that has a positive net present value. Well, another way of looking at that is by saying, we know that an organization will invest in any project in which the internal rate of return is greater than some minimum acceptable required rate of return. 
And a lot of times we call that the hurdle rate. And so this chapter uses that term hurdle rate. So look at that top block point up there. Hurdle rate is the minimum required rate of return um, that investors are expecting to receive on an investment. So remember what we have on that right hand side of the balance sheet. We have the bondholders and we have the shareholders who are providing capital to the executive leadership team. And then the executive leadership team then decides what to do with that capital. If, if it's someone like Johnson & Johnson, they invest in baby shampoo. If it's something like a financial institution, then they go out and invest in derivative securities. Those are just two examples. I mean, there are literally millions of examples. So what's our decision? So look at what I have down there on those uh, two circle points. If the RAROC is greater than the hurdle rate, which necessarily means that the net present value is positive, then we're going to say, therefore, accept. It adds value to the firm. Therefore, it's consistent with the goal of the business to maximize shareholder wealth because any project that has a positive NPV is going to add value. And then, of course, the flip side, if it's less than the hurdle rate, then we're going to reject it or terminate it. And that brings in the whole specter of uh, you know, the option to abandon, which is another really great capital budgeting discussion, which I'd love to have with you now, but it's not it's not a part of the chapter. So what what do we do? We accept projects that have zero or positive NPVs. We reject projects that have negative net present values. And I'm going to give you the example that I give my students, both undergraduate and graduate students. Think of this hurdle rate in the following manner. Remember, you got the bondholders and the shareholders over here on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. They're providing the capital. They are wagging their fingers. They're saying, look, Mr. and Mrs. Executive, you better earn 10% on our money or we're really going to be upset about it. And if we're upset about it, we're going to do things like sell our bonds and our shares of stock. We're going to call the Wall Street Journal and tell everybody what rotten executives you are and et cetera, et cetera. And so if the executives come back and say, hey, we're going to invest in this project and it turns out to have a 20 percent rate of return, the executives then say, look at how great we are. You wanted 10 percent and by golly, we delivered 10 percent. Plus, we delivered something else on top of that. Perhaps you should think about giving us a bonus or a raise or a helicopter service or whatever that is. Now, let's go ahead and compute this uh, this hurdle rate. So the notation there is the after-tax H, after-tax hurdle rate. And this is really just a weighted average. So look in the denominator, there's the common equity and the preferred equity. And then in the numerator are just the two, uh, the two interest rates. So look at the, the R sub CE and the R sub PE. Those are just the required return on common equity and the required return on preferred equity. In this context, you could call it the cost of equity, the cost of common equity and the cost of preferred equity. And so the question then becomes, how do you compute that R? Well, when you issue preferred shares, this is really an easy calculation. You know, most preferred shares issue a fixed dividend. So you take that fixed dividend and then you divide it by the amount uh, the amount of the preferred stock issue and you get some kind of a yield. So that's probably what that's going to be. And then the cost of common equity is going to be determined. Oh my gosh, this is the most exciting part of this uh, recording for me. The capital asset pricing model. Do you want me to give you a seven hour lecture on everything I know about capital asset pricing model? Go, go ahead and shake your head and say, no, Jim, we don't, we don't want that. But let's go ahead and just remind ourselves what that capital asset pricing model is. So I put it in, uh, I put it in purple over there. So notice what's happening. We're taking the R sub M, which is the return on the market portfolio. We're going to subtract out RF, which is the risk free rate of interest, which we talked about a few slides ago. So I want you to focus on that inside of the parentheses. Now, the capital asset pricing model was developed in 1964 by a guy named William Sharp and some others as well. But William Sharp was the winner of the Nobel Prize in economics for his work. And William Sharp said to us, he said, what's a reasonable estimate for the cost of equity for a publicly held firm? <clears throat> now, William Sharp knew that investors hold well diversified portfolios. 
So what William Sharp said was, you know what, the, the, the return, it has to, it has to start with what's going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That's what you should think of that R sub M, the expected return on the market portfolio. I think it's okay to think about New York Stock Exchange, but don't limit yourself. Think about what's going on on all of the stock exchanges, both uh, organized exchanges, which are physical places, and then over-the-counter markets as well. And what's going on in the New York Stock Exchange as it relates to the U.S. Treasury market. So that's called a market risk premium inside of those parentheses. And then, of course, it's weighted by the level of systematic risk of that particular security. Notice what the chapter identifies this as, and we, I have it as the second block point there. That's the firm's equity beta. Remember that equity betas, they are standardized random variables, and they pretty much fall between zero and two, although you can have some outside of that range. All right, so notice what we're going to do. We're going to take that computation that we just did the risk adjusted return on capital, and we're gonna subtract out that William Sharp's capital asset pricing model, and we're gonna call that the adjusted RAROC. And so look down at the bottom, this is what this, how this adds value. This is a revised decision rule. So if our adjusted R, can I just say adjusted R, if it's greater than the risk-free rate, then we're going to accept the project, and if it's less than the risk-free rate, then we're going to reject the project. Now, I think I have uh, two slides on challenges in modeling these diversification benefits. And um, we've had multiple slides in recent slide decks that asks us to identify some challenges. So this is what we're doing here. So we're trying to aggregate a firm's risk capital. All right, so here we have these different business lines. Remember, oh boy, in many, many recorded videos ago, we called these silos. Uh, in recent in recent recorded videos, these chapters referred to them as business lines. All right, so what we need to do is that we need to identify risk capital for each business unit. But then we need to aggregate them across those business units, you know, with the with the leadership of the chief risk officer. Now, the complicating factor is that you can't just take risk capital for one and risk capital for two and risk capital for three and then add them all together or subtract them or multiply or divide or whatever kind of a mathematical function you want to apply to them because there's bound to be some correlation between and among the silos. Ah, so what does this mean that the risk capital for the firm, right, the overall risk capital for the firm is probably going to be less and perhaps even significantly less than the sum of all of those individual risk capitals inside of each unit. And so in the paragraph inside of this chapter, uh, the challenge, as the textbook tells you, is that there's really not a great model out there that can estimate the correlation between market risk, credit risk, operational risk across those business units that does it with any kind of degree of sustainable accuracy, right? So there's the challenge there, um, which then leads into the second challenge, which is allocating capital among all of the different business lines, right? What do we want to do? We want to invest in positive net present value projects inside of each of our silos or our business lines, and hopefully risk capital and economic capital are going to help us make those decisions. But the challenge, look down at the bottom circle point, is that there is, it's really difficult to come up with a pre precise me method of attributing the diversification benefits. So if you have, you, you know, you put, let's say you have four units. So you got these four units and let's just make up some kind of a risk. So it's four and six and eight and 10, right? And so when you add them together, you, you get something less. So how do you, how do you uh, distribute those diversification benefits? I mean, you could just kind of equally do it, but then that's probably not too fair. Um, but notice what I have, what we have written in the bottom. Most settle for a prorated allocation approach. So that makes some sense. And then I think that last 
learning objective is a best practices, which is what we've done. So these block points that we have here probably are similar to what we've talked about before. Look at the first one. Let the senior management take charge of the entire process, right? So we got these business, we got the, we got the chief risk officer, and we've got all these leaders up here. Let them figure it out. Remember, these are really, really smart men and women. Firm-wide education, we've talked about the value of education and training many, many times. A review of key parameters, yes, we've talked about that. Data quality should be safeguarded, yep. All right, so look at the bottom two. Firms should combine our calculation here um, in this chapter with qualitative considerations. Oh my gosh, we've just had a bunch of slides in the previous recordings about quantitative and qualitative methods and ways to evaluate um, risk. And I like this last block point there. There should be active capital management. What does that mean? That means that this swings back to our definition of culture and our definition of risk culture. Active capital management means that everybody should be talking about the risk culture, which means that we're all active and everybody plays an active role in this. Of course, of course, the leaders in the board provides uh, uh, provides the basis for that culture. And I think that takes us through these learning objectives. Guessing those of you who are math inclined will focus on the two computes and the calculate, but um, I'm going to vote for probably that first one there because we're introducing this concept of risk capital and it's a theme throughout the rest of those learning objectives. So focus on risk capital and then focus on how risk capital is a part of those other learning objectives.